Uh, it's good to have you here today and, and encouraged by uh, the body this week, all the time we've been able to spend with each other. I was telling Terry and Marcia before service, man, I've seen you guys all week. Saw you on Sunday, saw you on Wednesday, saw you on Saturday, and Sunday again. So it's kind of cool. Kind of feel like we uh, have something special going right now. The Lord is kind of moving in our midst, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for how well you did um, serving uh, Ernie and, and Mary's family uh, through the passing of Mary this weekend, and uh, you did a great job with the mill, and I'm so thankful for that and encouraged by that. Um, we, we've been learning about, uh, the, in the book of Ephesians, this letter that Paul writes to the church, Dear Church, We've learned that we're rich, we've learned that we're works of art, that God dwells in us. We're often faced with this question, why did God let this happen? Like, sometimes in circumstances we look at things and we go, why, why would God allow this? And, and it's very um, difficult for us to kind of navigate through things sometimes when we are looking at experiences that we're going through and, and just feeling like, you know, we're just down about it. And um, the Apostle Paul gets that. And I think he, learned, he teaches us something today as, as we look at, once again, dear church, about circumstances. And he, uh, he says uh, in chapter 3, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, Paul was in prison when he wrote this. If you read the book of Acts, um, when you get toward the end of the... Um, book around chapter 18 and following, you start to see Paul gets, like he gets caught up in a, in a riot and he get, things start getting out of control and he's giving his testimony. And at one point, man, the, the Jewish people are just tuned into what he's saying as he's going through all of the, um, their history up to the time of meeting Christ. And then he says in his uh, speech or sermon or whatever you want to call it, his testimony, he says that Jesus called him to go to the Gentiles, and man, they didn't have any time for that. Like, like to the, the Jew, you want to talk about racism, to the Jew, a Gentile, which is anybody who's not a Jew, they, they labeled them as dogs, and they didn't have anything to do with him. And Paul was in prison because he said that Jesus came and opened up the, the God that the Jews were worshiping, that he opened up, that he was the Messiah, and it was for all people. And so he destroyed the barrier, and we looked at that last week, how the barrier of, of um, the, the wall of the Gentiles, that there was a, a wall around the temple that kept them from coming in, and, and he destroyed that. It made um, God approachable by all people, and so he was in prison because he was teaching that God dwells in all who believe, both the Jew and the Gentile. And the, and the Ephesian church, man, they had gone through this time where Paul had spent several years with them building this church. He was teaching, and, and he, there, there were believers just coming out of the ground. They were starting to, um, when I say coming out of the ground, they were, they were coming out of the woodwork. There were people giving their lives to Jesus. They were accepting him. They were being born again. They were being baptized. They were following the Lord. And so they were enjoying this time and this season of incredible growth in the church at Ephesus. And Paul ends up um, getting arrested. As he goes back to Jerusalem, he ends up getting arrested. And they didn't understand why God would allow that. Why would God allow such a fantastic mind, such a great theological mind, a guy that, that was against the church who now is for the church because of the work that the Lord did in his life, why would the Lord allow him to be placed in prison when he was doing so much good for the kingdom of Christ? Well, Paul, when we read verse 1, he's correcting them. Like, like they're down. They're asking the question, why would God allow you to be a prisoner of Rome? See, Rome locked him up because of the Jews and their, their accusation against him. Then he was a prisoner in Rome. But what does Paul say in verse 1? For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ. See, Paul, in his circumstances, being locked up, didn't see himself as a prisoner of Rome. He saw himself as a prisoner of Jesus. And so in our circumstances, whatever they may be, if we're locked up, we are prisoners of Christ. If we are sick and unhealthy, we are in Christ. If we are suffering, we are suffering in Christ. If things are going great in our lives, then we are, things are going great in Christ. Everything about us is about Christ, and that's what Paul wants us to see. And so he's correcting them, and they're asking the question, 
why would God allow this to happen for you to be locked up? He says, man, I'm a prisoner of Jesus. And then he quickly turns from his circumstances and he dives into the truth. And I love this about Paul. He's like, I don't have any time for that. Like, I, I want to get to the truth of the word of God and, and what it means for you and unpack this for you. And so he says, dear church, we know the sacred secret. He's like, forget about the fact that I'm locked up in prison. We know the sacred secret. Look at what he says in verses 2 through 6. Surely, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Jesus Christ. And so what is Paul, man, Paul like? He's saying a whole lot there. And I, I was, uh, I was uh, talking to my kids, just kind of working them through this, kind of had a moment around the dinner table this week on Thursday after I had finished putting the message together. And so I just shared it with them. And I said, man, I would get through here, and I, would, I was going through it, and I was like, man, can I get an amen and two Ric Flairs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so Zoe, man, Zoe got fired up, and she was like, woo, woo. Every time I'd say something, she was giving me a Ric Flair. Uh, so when we read, he, Paul says, when, when we're reading this, he says, listen, um, he says, I've already written briefly. And, and he says, making known by revelation as I've already written br briefly. And then verse 4, he says, in reading this. Now, there's so many times that I hear people, and this is what prompted that whole discussion around our dinner table that got me all the Ric Flair's is that faith said, well, I was like, man, I'm, I was in the Word today, and I was getting down in it, and, and, and I was digging out all these spiritual nuggets. I said, you guys, have you dug out any nuggets of gold from the Word? And, and so faith said, man, I have a trouble sometimes. I can't understand the Word. And so I just started breaking this down. I was like, well, something's wrong, because it says right here in verse 4, in reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the, the, the mystery of Christ. When we read what is written, the Bible teaches us we're able to understand and gain insight. Every time we open the Word of God, there ought to be a prayer where we're asking the Lord to do the supernatural. Like, Lord, give me what your word says you will give me. Give me the ability to understand it and gain insight into the truth of what is there that I'm finding in the word. Turn the lights on for me, Lord, because it says that when we read what is written, that is exactly what will happen. Paul says, I've written briefly, and I think he's referring to what he's written to uh, previously as he's talking about the riches and God dwelling in us and the barrier being destroyed and the gospel open to the Gentiles, when we read what is written, we're able to gain um, uh, an, uh, insight and to understand it. Now, one of the words that's very interesting here is the word mystery. Now, for us, when we think of mystery, we think of something that we're, you know, we're trying to figure out and it is, it is veiled intentionally. And, and there's some truth in that, in the meaning of this, but this, this word carries much more significance and depth as we unpack it um, from the original language. It is the word musterion, and it means that which was hidden is now made known. It is the sacred secret of God. God had kept hidden for thousands of years as he was hammering out through the law, through the Jewish people, he had kept hidden what he was going to do. He had kept it hidden for the, from the principalities and rulers, the angelic realm. He had kept it hidden. It was hidden away in God. It was the mystery of God. But now it, is, now it has been made known. It is a sacred secret, the mysterion of God. Now, the second word that I want you to key in on is the word administration. It comes from the Greek um, text oikonomia, and it means the implementation of a strategy. And so as Paul is telling us that we have the administration of God's grace was given to him, and he talks about it again. We'll see it, that word come up, administration, oikonomia. It will come up again in which we are to implement a strategy. Uh, and what is the strategy for? It is to make plain the gospel of the Lord. So the church 
in every age has a function in which it develops strategic plans to make the mystery plain to the lost. Like, like so we, we, we look and we go, okay, what is, what is the mission of the church? The mission of every church is the same. It is to make disciples. And so ours is like, a, we're a community of believers that are developing disciples in Christ. Uh, that's what every church should have, somewhat of a vision that is surrounded and a mission surrounded around that. But there is a strategy in which we have to go, okay, what is our strategy about how we're going to go about accomplishing what the mission of the church is when Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, here's our strategy that I think the Lord has us landing on in this, this year, 2018, and it is, I love it, man. The Lord is, I feel like the Lord has given me this, and, and, and it is this. Our strategy is to enjoy Jesus and each other so much that other people want to be around us. Like, like when we get together, we just enjoy the Lord, and we enjoy the Lord so much that we're surrendering to the Lord, and we're so good at surrendering to the Lord, it helps us to be able to enjoy each other more instead of be at odds with each other. We enjoy each other. We're pulling in the same direction, and because of that, when other people get around us, they sense that we're enjoying what we do, and we are enjoying what we do. We're not trying to enjoy it. We are just enjoying it, and because of that, we want to be together. When we come together, the outpouring of the Spirit happens because because we're gathered together, and Jesus said, we're two or more gathered, where am I? There in the midst of that. And he comes down into that, and, and, and people can be attracted to that, and I think that's exactly what the church is supposed to do. And so, so when we get together, like if I see you being all grum, I'm going to be like, hey man, you need to turn it around or go home, Right? Like we want to have fun. We want to have we want to enjoy each other. That is our strategy as a church to reach this community is to show them how to really enjoy life, not to be down on life, to be up on life regardless of the circumstances. Paul said, "I'm not a prisoner of Rome. I'm a prisoner of Jesus." And so everything that he looked like, this is why Paul could write, man, he said, I have learned to be content in all things, whether I have plenty or whether I'm in need. I know how to be content because why? I belong to the Lord. He has set me free. Dear church, we know the sacred secret. Here's the second thing. Dear church, the Lord will guide and provide. Look at verse 7. He says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Now, again, just jumping into the original languages to unpack because there's so much, you, you just can't, you, you can't take the English language sometimes and get all that is being said there uh, by the original author because the English language will not receive the Greek language in all its totality. And so when we look at these two words, they're fascinating words. There's actually three. One is the word um, uh, servant. He says, I became a servant. I became a servant. It is the um, word di diakonos, and it means a table waiter, always at the customer's bidding. I need some tea over here. Hey, could I get a refill on my coffee? Hey, this, this doesn't taste just right. Could you, do, like, could you send it back to the chef and bring oh, whatever you need? A servant. Like, we know what that is, right? We know a, what a waiter is. We go and we get something, we don't like it, we send it back, we ask, like we're gonna, we know that we're gonna pay them and, and give them a tip based upon their service for us. Well, this says, Paul says, I became a servant, a table waiter, a diakonos of the gospel. Like we, we are servants of the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news that Jesus Christ was the Messiah who came and died on the cross of Calvary and rose from the dead and he sets the sinner free. That is the sacred secret. So we are a servant of the sacred secret, the gospel of Christ, and we serve it and we are at its bidding. And that's challenging. Like we're all to be servants of the gospel. And so when we look at this and we go, okay, well, what is the next thing? Well, he says there are two other words, and it's the word, um, the, the, the word uh, working, he's working of his power. And it is the word energeia and the word dunamis. And those two words mean energeia, we, we, when we look at it in the original intent, it means spiritual energy, the energy of God. Like, you don't want me to get up here and preaching in the energy of Jesus. You want me to get up here in the energia, the spirit, the energy of the spirit, and, and, and to let God flow through me. 
And man, there's something real there. Like there's something that is not human that is happening. Many of you were able to come to the funeral, and I, I say, like, let, let me preface what I'm about to say. I, I hope this doesn't come out egotistical because that's not what I'm wanting to happen. Like, I'm just wanting to be authentic with you. But many of you have said, man, man it really was encouraged by the, the, the service. It was, you know, it was a great job. You have a gift, man. That is the Lord in me. Like, like I told Abby, like, something, and this happens to me all the time in funerals, man, I... I just feel like I'm like, I just open my mouth and it just comes out. Like there's a river just flowing through me. Like I can feel it. And it is the spiritual energy of God accomplishing what? His work as I yield as a servant, a table waiter of the gospel. That's why God is using me that way. And that's why the way God wants to use you is through his spiritual energy when you begin to understand that you have the sacred secret and that God wants to do things in your life. He will use his spiritual energy and not only that, the dunamis. It is where we get our word dynamite. It is the power of God. It is the power that brought Jesus back from the dead. And so in the energy and the power of the Spirit, we are able to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish when we yield as servants of the gospel. And so our lives are to be one, lives that are lived in humility before the Father as we yield to the truth of the word. And we go, you know what? This whole thing is about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about my possessions. It's not about my rights. It's not about what I want to do. I am a servant of the gospel. And I yield in humility to Jesus, and that humility is an essential qualification for effective kingdom service because the energia and the dunamis is released in my life when I humbly come before the Lord and say, I am yours. I'm here to serve at your bidding. Take me where you want, Lord. I will go and wherever you guide me. And, and, and what I, I realize that wherever you take me, I'm not afraid to step into that because you will provide in that moment. Jesus said, when you pray, pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Like, Jesus isn't saying pray like that all the time. He's saying, this is what I'm going to do in your life. Like, if you become a servant of the gospel, I will give you the provision and take you where I want you to go and provide all that is necessary when you get there because I'm going to put the sacred secret into you. I want you to enjoy it so much that when you get around other people, it is contagious and they want in on it and you are able to reveal to them the mysterion of God. That's what the Lord wants us to do. And if we're not doing that, then we are not living what we have been saved to live out on a daily basis. This is what makes life thrilling. It is the purpose of God, and we will see that here in a moment. So, dear church, we have the sacred secret. Dear church, the Lord will guide and provide. And dear church, the Lord uses the least to reach the lost. He uses the least to reach the lost. Look at uh, 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 chapter, verse 8. Although... I am the least of all the Lord's people. This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent, watch this church, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. The least of who? Who does Paul say that he's the least of? He doesn't say the least of the apostles. He says the least of who? All God's people. If I'm one of God's people, then Paul is saying I'm the least of God's people. And so if, if Paul is saying that he is lesser even than I am before God, then certainly God can use me. And certainly God can use you. And God will use the least to reach the lost. All of God's people. That is us. So God makes nobody somebodies. Amen? And a Ric Flair. 
<laughs> God makes nobodies somebodies. And so why does God do that? Like, why does God take a nobody and make them into a somebody? To make plain the mystery. Now, what does this mean, to make plain? It is the Greek word photism, and it means to light up. So God takes a nobody, he makes him into somebody in order to light up the gospel, the sacred secret that was hidden in God in eternity past. So it was kept hidden in God. It was God's plan from the beginning. Like before the human was created, it was God's plan from the beginning to come to the planet and save humanity. And so from the beginning, it was God's plan. So that logically leads us to the conclusion we would do well to participate in it. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever not to participate in what I'm talking about. It makes no sense to take this lightly. It makes no sense to live every day like God is going, uh, like if, if, if every day, like it would make no sense to not live every day like God was going to use me to do something to shine light on the gospel for Christ. Because why? I am a servant at the bidding call at the gospel. And as he bids and calls me, I come because I am the servant and he will guide and provide exactly what I need because he uses the least to reach the lost and I'm a part of that. And, and, and when we look at this and this whole idea of lighting up, this becomes so cool. This is so like, like this is so not like, it is, it is a sense, in a sense it is obedient, okay, what we're talking about. But it's easy obedience. It's like learning how to yield to the Father because you understand how the Father operates in the world. It's learning how to yield to God and not trying to obey God and, and treating God like a cosmic principle, but, but realizing that we are servants of the gospel and we yield to him because he moves through us, his spiritual energy moves through us, his spiritual power moves through us so that we can shed light on the sacred secret and make it plain to the lost. Now, the church becomes a mirror through which the bright ones of heaven see the glory of God. This is very important. I want to refer you back to, uh, we'll start in verse 10. I want you to read this, like look, follow along on the screen if it's up there or, or in your Bible or in your, your worship folder. His intent, God's intent, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to who? The rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. And so the church becomes the mirror through which the bright ones of heaven see the glory of God. The angelic realm, both fallen angels that we classify as demon, demons, and the angelic realm itself that which we cannot see, but we know that through the word, it functions here on the planet. It is the angelic realm who gave the news to Mary that she would conceive of the Holy Ghost and that what the seed born in her would be of God. And it was the Messiah that she would carry that would take away the sins of the world. And what did she do? The least God chose to save the lost. She was the least. She was the last person on the world that anybody on the planet would have chosen besides God because he chooses the least to save the lost. And so he puts himself inside of her, and she yields. Why? She's the... What does Mary say? Like, I'm the servant of the Lord. Be it as you have said. I'm the, she says to the angel, I'm the servant of the Lord. I'm a handmaid of the Lord. She realizes that, that her heart, is, the reason God chose to use her and his spiritual energy and his spiritual power were, 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 came over her to bear the Messiah was because she was at a place of humility in her life and God knew that he could trust her with such a significant task. Now, in us, the church becomes the mirror through which the bright ones, those like even that angel that, that spoke to Mary... <laughs> They couldn't see the hidden secret of God. Like, here's what I try to do with you guys all the time is I try to talk about identity. I try to teach about who you are in Christ. The angelic realm could not see the sacred secret. Even the devil himself could not see the sacred secret, a fallen angel. And they, they, they could not comprehend exactly what grace was like until the church showed up 
in history. It was hidden in God. This is why you come across all these passages until the perfect time, the fullness of time had come. Then God sent his gift, his son, to the world. This word manifold comes from the Greek word polypoikolos, and it means very varied. Okay? So I'm using a lot of Greek words today, I know, because I want you to think I'm smart. No. (laughs) I have good software, too. So so there's a lot of Greek words, but but they, they put this thing thing together. And so the word means very varied. And nowadays it's, it's used as a, a, a technical term in geology, meaning assorted crystals. And so the wisdom of God embodied in Christ, who indwells a believer. Remember, we are rich and that God dwells in us. So the wisdom of God embodied in Christ, who indwells a believer is this, um, it's, 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 this wisdom is like an iridescent like unfolding beauty, like, a, like the photism, we go back to that, we light up that we make the gospel plain, so we humbly submit as servants of the gospel. God pours forth his spiritual energy and dunamis in us, and it lights up in our lives, and it reflects back to God, and we're like crystals to the Lord. And, and, and we're all like revealing a different tone, a different color, and, and, and we're, we're, we're impacting the people around us when we're yielding humbly in obedience as servants of the gospel and the wisdom of God is shed abroad in our hearts. In Christ, we are many splendored beings radiating the Lord's glory. The church is a radiant church, a radiant bride. And so when we yield, the Lord is pouring forth his power. And so like we, we begin to think about um, diving into the word and understanding the more of God's truth. And, and, and sometimes we think, well, man, I want to be careful about talking about the gospel because I don't want people to think um, that I, I, I am a, 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 a person with a big head because I understand the things of God. Let me tell you something about understanding the, the deep things of God. Understanding the deep things of God does not give a man a big head. It gives him a broken and contrite heart. When you get in there, man, and you like are looking at it and it's beginning to unfold you and breaking your heart, you just are like, man, I can't believe I even get to be a part of this. And the Lord looks down and he goes, that's what I'm looking for right there. Let me pour out some energy on that. Let me pour out some power on that. Let me let that right there, that heart right there radiate back to me. Because that heart will reveal the sacred secret, the mysterion of God that has been kept hidden, that is now being revealed and made known to the rulers. And so even the angelic realm can look at a human being and begin to see and understand the grace of God. Because we have free will that we're able to place our trust in God and God saves us from our sins and the grace covers us. And so the, the angelic realm is looking at the church to see the plan of God unfold in history. And we're looking back to this imminent return of Jesus when he comes back, not as a suffering servant, but as a conquering king, riding on the white horse with a sword in his mouth that is the word of God. That when we read it, we are able to understand it with our minds and gain insight and to allow ourselves to become even greater servants of the gospel so that the Lord can pour out more power in our lives and use us to accomplish his will on the planet. And Jesus is coming back for his church. And so this is why Jesus calls us in John chapter 15 to abide. Because when we enjoy, like like he says, in him, look at verse 12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. With freedom and confidence, I can approach God. And, and when I do that, when we enjoy such freedom and confidence with God, we acquire boldness before men. The way to become a bold person at work is not to just go, well, I'm just going to do it, and I'm going to get in there, and I'm just going to let everybody know I know Jesus. Jesus. Like those are people who mess things up in the kingdom. The way to do it, man, 
is to get with the Lord on a daily basis and get your time and your abide time with Christ and realize that your personal worship and your personal reading of the word will shine light in your life, the photism, and it'll be illuminated. And God will put the spiritual energy in you and God will put the spiritual power in you. And when you show up to work, it'll just come out. Like you're not even having to think about it. It's just happening. It's just coming out of your life and you're not afraid anymore because of the freedom and the confidence that you have to enter into the throne room of God. Then you are increased in your boldness with men as God does a work in your life. Here's the big idea. Dear church, don't be discouraged by your circumstances. It doesn't matter what happens to us in life. This is not going to change what I just taught. And that's why Paul comes back to verse 13. Remember verse 1, he says, I'm the prisoner of the Lord. And verse 13, he ends this particular section of his letter. And he says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you. Why? Because they are for your glory. They're your glory. My sufferings are your glory. The Lord, you see, when we look at this, what he's saying to us is the Lord is educating angels by means of his body, the church. Paul was in prison. He was a prisoner of the Lord. Your circumstances, whatever they may be, are for the glory of God. As you are a servant of the gospel. So don't get discouraged. When things aren't going perfect, just look, look, wait a minute. Like I, I know the Lord. The Lord is moving in my life and just yield to him and allow him to do his work. And as he does his work, then you can navigate through any storm you face, whether you are on top of the mountain or going through the valley. And if you're on top of the mountain today, brace yourself. You will enter a valley. Like nowhere in Scripture are we taught that when we meet Jesus, everything is rosy and perfect. As a matter of fact, the 12 apostles that were used of the 11 that were left after Judas hung himself, 10 of them were executed for believing in Jesus. So it doesn't matter how bad you get, just tell yourself, well, I still got my head, you know? And so there's like our circumstances don't determine our effectiveness for the kingdom, and they don't determine our satisfaction in the world because the eternal purpose of God was to keep this hidden until he unveiled it through his church in which his son, Jesus, risen from the dead, sends back the Holy Spirit, lives in us. That's why you are referred to as the hands, the feet, the eyes, and the ears. The body of Jesus. We are the body. And that's why Jesus said the gates of hell can't stop us. Because we are the body of Christ. And so let us be that body.